This is a production of Cornell University. Um, uh, so I, I wanted to start by acknowledging and, and, and thanking uh, Cayuga Nation. Uh, we're on the ancestral homelands of the uh, Cayuga Nation and I uh, want to uh, thank them for their, uh, their stewardship of the land and, um, and especially with this talk being about, about traditional ecological knowledge, it's, just, it's especially important. But, but it's, I think it's important for all of us to, to think, think about that. Um, so I also wanted to acknowledge um, several people who, who have worked with me. These are primarily uh, graduate students. Um, Adolfo Chunkin is actually from a village of Lakenha Chansayab, which will be featured in, in um, some of the things I'm going to talk about. But Eli Arno, uh, Austin Arrington, Jessica Bond, Avalon uh, Bungie, uh, Tomek Falkowski, who's also here, Eugene, who's here, Isaias Martinez, and Danny Rayom and, and John Sager, their, their work is going to be part of this presentation. Um, and, and I, of course, as we all know, couldn't do most of the things that we do without this, you know, the engines of our, of our work, if you will. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and actually the, the chassis and the, everything, really, of our, of our, of our work, not just, not just the engines, not just the dirty, oily part, but really the, the shiny, wonderful things that we see as well. So, and uh, people we see. So I'm going to talk about traditional ecological knowledge and, and what we learned from TK, specifically for agroecosystem design. And then, so what, how might TK guide our, our designs of agroecosystems. It's something I've been thinking about for a long time, and the, the folks that, that, that I mentioned before, the last 10 years or so, just thinking about uh, traditional ecological knowledge. So I started, as Eugene mentioned, uh, looking at eco ecological engineering, and I was working in Honduras on constructive wetlands for wastewater treatment. That was my master's work. And I, um, you know, the, the, the ecological engineering, I don't know if folks, uh, no, so it's a design of ecosystems for the mutual benefit of humans and the environment. Humans are a part of the environment, not apart from the environment. Uh, human engineering is supplementary rather than primary. And, and I was just, I, I was fascinated with this as a, as a way of looking at how we can fix a lot of the problems, particularly in lesser developed areas of, of the world because it's a natural system, low energy system. And, and but, when I was doing my master's, I wandered in a place called Navalom Institute. It's giving you a little bit of background here. It said, it's a place in Chiapas, Mexico, in southern um, um, most state of Mexico, in San Cristobal de las Casas. And, and, and there I saw a movie about the Lacandon Maya. And it was this indigenous group living in the rainforest and, and growing rainforest. And I was like, and it, you know, an anthropologists had looked at it a little bit, and I was like, wow, you know, that, that's ecological engineering. And it's so much better and more complex, at least more complex than anything I was learning about in, in books and reading in, 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 in the scientific journals. And so I was like, wow, I wanna, I wanna learn about that. I wanna learn from them. And so I was like, I want to do that for my, my PhD. And so I was like, it's okay. So they don't speak Spanish. I was just learning Spanish at the time so I could do my, my project work in, in, in Honduras. And so I was like, okay. So I learned Yucatec Maya. It was another it's language because I was taught at, at University of North Carolina. Well, it wasn't taught, but there was a linguist who knew it. So he taught me Yucatec Maya so that I could learn Lacandon Maya. So then I could work with the the Lacandon Maya in a village in, in Chiapas, Mexico. And so that took me a long time and actually went and worked as an environmental consultant in between. And, 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 and then I, you know, started, and I would think about the, the ancient Maya, you know, you think about the ancient Maya, just going to be a sense, the ancient Maya, you know, the, you know, the, you, you think about these folks there, you know, with the temples and, 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 and this, this, this traditional, this ancient, culture with the and and these migrations from the and the fall of the maya but actually the maya oh that our maya is about 65 uh 50 is it 55 65 ethnic groups in in mesoamerica and their whole 
groups of people, it's 60% of the population of Mesoamerica is Maya, right? And so I was gonna learn about the Lacandomai, but keep that in the back of your mind, that there are actually a lot of other folks living in, in this area who might know a lot about ecosystems. And so, so I, I, from this, I started to think about traditional ecological knowledge. You know, all of these folks living with the land, living on the land, living from the land, and that gives them a very intimate understanding of that, of that ecosystem. So the folks I saw in a movie were doing that, but maybe other folks were. And they work with limited resources, and so maybe there's something we can learn from traditional ecological knowledge when we have resources that are diminishing. And maybe when we have things like climate change happening, right? And so I started to, to think about it. So think about that definition of traditional ecological knowledge. And over the years, I've started to realize that there's several things that we can learn from, from traditional ecological knowledge, at least what I've learned from traditional ecological knowledge, looking at a lot of different systems at this point. So natural systems are complex, but designable. That folks have been designing systems for a very, very long time. And they've been doing it in a very, very complex manner. So I was looking at constructed wetlands and thinking, oh, that was all so cool. But then I saw a group that was designing an ecosystem, which I am going to tell you about more. So don't feel like, like I talked about these fantastic system and when is it going to talk about? I am going to talk about. Um, so, and then natural elements like stress events and succession are important. Now, Many of you are, are agroecologists, so you think about your stress events on the farm. That's something, sometimes things you don't want to have in there. But maybe some stress events are valuable and important for change. And then food's everywhere and valuable. You know this, you're agroecologists, right? Or who's, who's an agroecologist in the room? Okay, it's not all of you are agroecologists. Okay, so I'll, I'll change the token. Are some of you like economists? Or what, what, what are you? <laughs> are you the, the, like, what are if you? Like, what do, you call, what do you call yourself that's not an agroecologist? Give me a sense of who's the, who the audience is. Soil science. Soil science. What else? Biologist. What? Soil scientist. Soil scientist. Okay, what else? <laughs> Plant ecologist. Plant ecologist. Okay, so they're, they're, they're you know, still kind of natural. I just want to get a sense. Of, so, but so food is everywhere and valuable. Okay, but we think about it in the United States, like food in the agroecosystem. But I'm talking about everywhere, right? So food's not here, but maybe it should be. In this room even, maybe along the edge there. So, okay, so food's everywhere in value. Wildlife is everywhere in, and valuable in traditional ecology. And connection to place is critical. Connection to place. Like in your system, in your agroecosystem, connection to place, well, maybe that's important. Maybe that's critical for traditional ecological knowledge. So natural systems are complex. Um, so, I, like I said, I was working in Chiapas, Mexico, which is the southernmost state of Mexico with the Lacandon Maya. And, and, and this is Lacanhat Chansayab, a village that I started working with, and working in the, in the Lacandon rainforest. There's Guatemala, uh, Chiapas, and in this village of you know, about 400 people live in, in Lacanhat Chansayab. And, and here I am uh, starting out my doctoral research um, with, 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 with Jorge Paniagua and Chanuk. Uh, uh, and, and, and this is a traditional dress of the Lacandomaya. It kind of looks like a, a long hospital gown almost. Um, but it, it, it's traditionally, this outfit is actually made out of the bark of a tree. Like a pound the bark of the tree. So it's made from, from nature itself, even what folks are wearing. This one is actually made of cotton. And folks live within the ecosystem so they're a part of that ecosystem, not apart from the ecosystem. So very much like what I was thinking about with ecological engineering. And they have this very, very complex form of agroforestry. So this is, this is, um, this is agroforestry in time. So you have a core, which is the first successional stage. And so this is a polyculture of around 60 or so different plants. Then you have a robier and a hurupche, 
And these are, these are, this is, this is a shrub stage, this is the later shrub stage. And then you have a Pak Che Ko and a Mehen, Mehen, a Mehen Che. Now, now, Tomek, I've been working with Tomek, and, and, and we've divided out Pak Che Ko and Mehen Che into two. At the time, when I first did it, I didn't include Pak Che Ko, which literally means planted tree milpa, or planted tree polyculture. Um, and that lasts about 20 years. That's, that's the, that's the um, uh, first secondary forest stage. And this is a later secondary forest stage. And then you have a fire. And you might have a fire at different stages in the system. And then you have what's called the Tom Che, which is a conserved forest. So they have area cycling around. So you might have different areas. So you're looking in space. So this is like, you might have a Tom Che over here and a, and a Pak Che Ko over here and a core. So you have a polyculture, you have a, you have a a, a, a secondary forest stage, a later secondary forest stage, a, a shrub stage, and they're going at different times. Each one of these stages is productive. And so in 40 years or so, they might cycle around, and so they grow rainforest, right? And, 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 and they're harvesting and using every phase of, this, of the stage. This is complex ecological engineering. And, and so I looked more and more, and you look at the, at the soil, you all, you know, soil scientists, you see oil, soil organic matter and, and, and soil uh, nitrogen increasing over, over time. By the time the, the Nucus Che, the Tam Che, which is the, by the time of the advanced secondary forest, it's similar soil, at least in soil nitrogen and, and, and organic matter. We actually have looked at nutrients, and we looked at uh, phosphorus and, and, and looked at nematodes saw similarities between these, these actually statistically uh, equivalent, um, uh, indistinguishable uh, uh, with these advanced secondary forest and, and, the, and the primary forest. So you see systems that are, are developing and they're developing rapidly. Uh, you see, if you just let it go, uh, it, literature is showing as much as twice as, as uh, can, can take, in that particular area, can take nearly twice as long for the, for the system to develop in some cases. Okay, and then you look at these, at these systems, and it's a woody species richness. You look at the first successional stage going up to the sixth successional stage. What do you see between the fourth and the sixth successional stages? By the time you get to early secondary forest, your woody species richness is essentially identical to the primary forest. So not growing stands of pine here. They're growing a diverse rainforest, right? At least that's the plan. That's the design. So, so you know, there, there, it seems like there's a lot that we can learn from that. And so I was like, well, is it just lock and high chance to yeah? Is it just the lock and don't Maya? And I was like, well, uh, let me look. And, and so I started working with the Yucatec Maya community, Itza Maya community, uh, Mopan Maya community, Sotzil Maya, and I've since worked with other communities looking at these agroforestry systems, the traditional systems, this traditional ecological knowledge to kind of get a sense of, of what's going on. And one of the things that I've, in addition to seeing a lot of complexity, I talked about design. In these different places, Lacandon Maya, Yucatec Maya, a couple of Yucatec Maya, there's a Mopan Maya, you see it in other communities as well. There's certain species that they're using to restore soil. So they, now, they're different species in some cases, but they think about that as this is what we're gonna plant here, what we're gonna leave here, so that the soil regenerates more rapidly. And some of them are planted and some of them are left. And, and, and one of the species, this is, this is a chroma pyramidale, you see these lot of leaf litter. And so we tried to figure out mechanisms associated with that. And it looks like you see leaf litter with distance from the tree. And of course it goes down, this is, this is logarithmically. And then nematodes actually went up with distance away from the tree. So that seems like counterintuitive. Seems like where you'd have leaf litter, you'd have more nematodes, right? The soil, the roundworms in the soil. And so started to think about this particular species maybe inhibiting um, degradation. And there's another species in there, Piper arithum, 
and Piper Adunkum, if you look at the list here, and, and, and Piper Arintum has saffron in the, in the leaves, which has, is a cytotoxin. So maybe there's some sort of slowing down of degradation that folks are using. And, and we've looked at some other species and it's, it's, it's hard to see the mechanisms exactly it's, as it might be different functions of different species. And, and, and maybe not all Lacandomaya are cognizant of all of these, of these functions, but it's definitely something to consider, to think about why and how are folks designing as they're designing. Now, I, I talk about the Lacandomaya and I'm not gonna, and that, and over time, I've looked at systems not just in Mesoamerica, but throughout the world, if you think about people and their ecosystems, people have traditionally managed and, and been part of their ecosystems for all of the world. So this is actually, I've become interested recently in, in um, vineyards in Portugal. So this is a traditional vineyard system in, in, in Portugal. And this is a system, this is from 1474, and, and in Portugal, I don't know if you can see this, but there are trees, and then there are vines growing, growing up the trees. And, and, and these systems, the, the vines are actually supported on the trees as part of, of, of the vineyard. And, and I was like, wow, that's, that's fantastic. It actually comes from, from the, originally from the Greeks, and then the Etruscans, and then the and, and then from there to um, uh, uh, the Romans, and then, then from there to Portugal. And, and, and so I read that there's some systems like this in, in Portugal. And so I was like, wow, I wanna go look at that. And, and said that it's not possible, and I need to find out if there, if there are systems like this. And, and there are, there's systems that are in place right now. And what the literature says is hypothesizing is that these trees are actually providing some sort of um, irrigation through hydraulic redistribution. So they're bringing up water during the day and then, and then dropping it at, at, at night. And, and, what the, and I had to learn Portuguese to, so I learned, so I, so I, I mean, I don't, and so I, I'm, I'm, uh, I don't speak Portuguese really well yet, but I was still, the farmers were very patient with me and, 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 and talked very slowly with me. And, and, um, and what, it, what it looks like, and I did some soil sampling around uh, these trees and found moisture soils and moisture soils near the pollarded trees, because they're pollarded trees, and good cooler soils. And, um, and then at the same time, these, with these trees, which are essentially the fence of these traditional systems, are producing um, in a two hectare system with a diverse polyculture in the middle, they're they're producing 1,500 liters of wine from their fence. You know, I mean, that's a really valuable product. That's a, that's a border to, this, to the system. And so, so this is a lot more to look at here until you look at what you can learn from our traditional and local ecological knowledge. You know, there might be something to learn here. Now, the European Union is incentivizing farmers moving away from these systems. So these systems are disappearing right now because they want the, the row system, right? Well, we know, you all know with climate change, I mean, that, the, that, that vineyards and wine production globally is in this state of crisis. Everything's moving northward, right? And so having a system, a natural system that doesn't require a lot of irrigation, right? That's actually bringing water up from, from, from deep zones to manage water and temperature, that seems valuable. And maybe it's, maybe it's not happening, maybe, maybe it's, but it's definitely worth researching, right? It's definitely worth knowing a little bit more about. And so that's, so, so then natural elements like stress events and succession are important. They're part of most of these systems, right? And you look at, so in the Black and Doan system, you have fires. And Tomek's going to start working at looking at black carbon in, in these systems a little bit more and how carbon is uh, 
it, what's happening with the carbon. But the, at least a little bit of the work that we've done <laughs> indicates that these systems might be a carbon sink if the, if the burn is a low enough temperature. I don't know. We've seen, we've seen carbon accumulating at a meter. So maybe there's some carbon that's moving down through the, through the soil profile um, from the burn. Uh, most Sweden systems throughout Mexico, really, and out throughout the world, use fire as part of a part of a, a traditional um, means of of controlling pests, uh, of controlling uh, weeds, uh, of 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 adding uh, uh, kind of an exchange capacity. It, there's a lot that's beneficial from the use of fire potentially, right? And so maybe we need to understand that a little bit better. Right now, the UN is incentivizing moving these systems out, out of what we do, actually, actually giving communities money to not burn before we know really what's cycling and how it's cycling. And, and so we need to know more about this, right? And this is the, this is the from our, our recent paper about the Lock and Dome Mine, you see a little bit more complexity. There's an added stage of Pakche Kor and the Mehen Che. But you see these succession and systems. And so even, even my undergraduate students, I ask them to think about, you know, how would you have a successional system in central New York? No, well, is that possible? I mean, that sounds crazy, right? That's completely crazy. We're, 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 we're in, our instrumentation does not allow us to do that. Our, 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 our machines do not allow us to do that. And no, they do not allow us to do that today. That is true. But what about 30 years from now? I mean, can we start to think about that? Can we start to think about succession in the system and what that might, that's a natural process. By stopping succession, we have to put in energy. Succession happens in ecosystems. And that's why traditional systems throughout the world use succession. You look at the Mopan Maya in Belize, I thought the Lock and Dome Maya system was pretty cool having having six, now seven, successional stages, the Mopan Mayan system of Belize has nine. So there's a lot of complexity in the way people are managing and thinking about succession. We looked at the Zapotec system and a little bit further north. Once again, you see succession in the systems. Food is everywhere and valuable. Now, 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 we're working in agriculture here, so, so of course we think about food being everywhere and valuable, but we don't think about it being, we think about it being valuable. We market it, we grow it, we know we need it, right? But is it everywhere? Can we think about it being everywhere? This is the Lacandone myosisin. These are useful species, and most of them are, are useful, I mean, they're useful for a lot of different reasons, but every, these are once again the successional stages of the Lacandone system, the original one from the first articles where we published with those stages. And you see 60% of the species in every successional stage, including the forest stage, are useful. Now this is talking to people and asking them what's useful here. What can you eat? What can you, what, what can you use for raw materials? But, but there's a lot of eating going on in later successional stages. Imagine going into an advanced forest, and maybe there's some other people in it, this is, go, you're going into a secondary forest, and, and you know 70%, for 70% of the species, you can name a use. Name the name of the species and name a use, at least one use. That is a knowledge that's hard for us. Can, can, can anyone in the room do that? I mean, that's incredible. That, that level of knowledge is, and, and that level of knowledge it comes from an intimate relationship with that ecosystem. So food is everywhere and useful. Now, now we think about food, so I'm talking about um, temporary, like over long term, long time, right? Now, what about throughout the year? We always think about, even in, even in the tropics, we think about a, you know, a harvest season, right? And that's going to be like corn, the harvest season. Who's worked in the tropics, right? There are a few people. So, so you're going to see a harvest season in the, in the north of around August, September for your corn, right? And that's where, the, and we see that here. Here's August right here. You've got a lot of corn there. 
this is calories. So th this is, once again, a, a, this, I should have uh, a, a cited um, Tomek before. This is someone worked with Tomek and, 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 and I worked on. And, and, um, but look at, this, look at this harvest through the year. Look at it, going from January to January. What do you notice about that harvest? Is it just corn? No, no, it's not just corn, right? It's throughout the whole year that people are harvesting. They're harvesting pineapple. They're harvesting yucca. They're, 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 harvesting, um, they're harvesting lots and lots of different medicinals. They're harvesting onions. They're harvesting uh, jalapenos, that, you know, beans. I mean, throughout the year, and you have a lot of calories. You look about the nutrients, it's also regulated throughout the year. So it's a different way of, of thinking about even harvest. It's, it's all the time. It's everywhere. It's in the, it's in the forest. It's everywhere. Imagine if there was, there was something to harvest right here. But, and then, so I think about it, is it just traditional folks? I was in the Balkans, right? This was uh, about, was that, when was it there now? It was like a, almost a whole year ago. It seems like yesterday. So I, I was in the Balkans, and I was, I, so you look at, this is street food in the Balkans. So, so during the time of the Soviet Union, a lot of, a, there was a lot of food produced in these large systems, right? But people did not stop producing for themselves. Food was everywhere, and people explained to me, it's like, you know, we never stopped producing at our home. You look throughout the world, people are producing at their homes. I was, I was walking down the street, like this is the street. I was walking down the street in Albania. And I, and I looked at this, and this right here, and I looked up, and I looked up, and I was like, what is that? And, and it, was, it was a grapevine, and it was that thick. And, and I was like, where is that coming from? And I looked, and it was, it was coming through a wall. Like, so they built the wall around the grapevine, right? Like that, or they broke a hole, like the grind's coming through, let's just keep on going. There were grapevines growing on gas stations. People were making wine at the gas station. <laughs> you know, it's just a different ethic. But it, but it should give us hope because that ethic, which I say it was a lock and don't no, no, it's most of the world. We are abnormal. Most of the world is thinking like this, right? And so we just need to tap into it a little bit. Okay, so I, and then, this was, this was, so I was in, I, was, I gave a talk at, at the Darwin Foundation in um, uh, last year and about food and restoration. And, and, um, and I, I arrived and I was like, you know, I want to talk about food. I want to talk about food being everywhere. And I, so I asked people at the foundation, I asked everyone, everyone at the foundation, I asked anyone I met, say, well, what can you eat here on the Galapagos Islands that's wild? And, and I, I, saw, I, I saw the Apuntia everywhere, right? Apuntia is nopales, right? If you anyone who's been in Mexico, that's, it's, that's a really nice fried up in eggs. It's really good. And I was like, I saw it everywhere. And everyone was like, nope, can't eat anything. Galapagos is a, is a, it's a conservation area, right? And people were like, no, no, you can't, can't eat it. And they weren't talking about it's not permitted. They were like, oh, no, it's a different species of Apuntia. There's no way. And um, you're going to get, no. They're, they're, and, and it's like, well, what about these? There's like grape. I mean, not, not grapes, there's tomato-like things. I mean, can I eat? No, 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 that's, that's poisonous. It's poisonous. Everything was poisonous. Everything was dangerous, right? And, and, and finally, I ran into a guy named Watto, who is, who is, who is a, he's a, a, a ranger, right? And he's like, oh, yeah, you can eat this and that and that and this and that and this and that. And, that. and then I gave my final, final presentation after I'd done this research while I was there, because I had a couple of days before my presentation. And, and I said, well, Watto said you can eat all of this stuff here. And, um, and then Watto said, oh, yeah, you know what? We've stayed alive. Rangers have stayed alive because of this, right? But we, change, we have a different mindset about what we can eat and what we can't eat. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's phenomenal. The, 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 
no, I, it, it didn't make any sense to me that a, that a tortoise could eat it and I couldn't, right? I mean, they're not too different. We're not too different. And we're, there was the differences. I understand, but there's a lot of similarities, right? Then wildlife is everywhere and, and valuable, right? So in our agri ecosystems, it's valuable. This is, once again, Tomek did, did, did this work and, and it followed on Jessica Bond's work, who I mentioned as well, looking at Yucatec Maya system, the, the um, birds in these different, uh, on the reserves and in the agroforestry systems. And she found no differences. And then Tomek went across successional stage. Here's a reference, this is the reserves, seeing a similar, was statistically, you know, that no, no, not distinguishable uh, between the, the successional stages and the amount of, of species of birds. So maybe these systems are actually valuable to wildlife. Now then we started to look at different, uh, this is once again, Tomek looking at, at, at these successional stages and seeing some the changes by successional stage and by Tom Che, by the later successional stage of Nukus Che, you're starting to see the reserves and, 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 and the birds being, being similar. Milp is much more dissimilar. Um, uh, and then it can it kind of, the similarity increases as you, as you grow, go through. But maybe having this diversity of landscapes adds to overall diversity of the system. So maybe, maybe, maybe the, the systems are in some ways valuable for, for this gamma diversity, right? Then we looked at wildlife and I was talking to folks <clears throat> about it and they were like, oh yeah, well, I was talking to Adolfo Chung King uh, uh, in, in Lock and High. He's like, you know what, climate change, we're not too concerned about it. There's a, 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 a Adolfo Chung King is Lock and Domaya and he grew up with, uh, and it, it, it's his father's uh, assistant, so knew a lot early on. His father died at a, 101 and, and he was, was worked with him for the last 10 years of his life every day. And so I learned, learned a lot about the, the systems. And he said, you know, we're not too worried about climate change because we use actually the nature to tell us when it's gonna rain. So this is a howler monkey. It makes a call when rain is gonna come. This is a chachalaca and, and this is the green lacewing larvae. And I was like, and each one of those, so this is gonna be changing coloration. This is gonna give a call. And, and we just did some recent work in Lakanha looking at the green lacewing larvae over time. And, and it's called kucha. They call it, that's the name. It, and it literally means carries water. So even the name is associated with, with function, right? In Lakandon Maya. And um, it's a good thing, you know, we, I learned like a domaya for something valuable for something for sure. Um, I, aside from communicating with folks, it allows you to understand the system. So the coloration change changes, and we're thinking that it has to do with um, camouflage. So it's changing the 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 trees will actually change in color as you go through the year and it gets rainier, and, and they, they will say that the green lace wing will actually change and get darker and when the rains are gonna come. And so they'll use that to, to determine when they're gonna plant. And, and there are a bunch of different species that they're using, and we looked at, oops, uh, you see coloration, and this is the average white color and with humidity, and so you see a relationship there between, between the coloration, and this is John uh, Zeiger, who's a, a master's student, with me and um and so you see with humidity and so you've seen these things that are that seem valuable and they, and they they use it turns out i thought it was just three species they're actually using about 20 different species to indicate for them species and halos like solar halos when it's going to some plant some animal when it's going to rain and they tell them different things so this is through the year, and so these different species have different population patterns. And it's that complexity of understanding that allows them to determine when to plant. I mean, that's, that's, that's a lot of knowledge. That's a, that's a lot of understanding of, of patterns. And but then, okay, so I said, okay, wildlife, important, population and, and that's valuable. And I should say back to wildlife, 
you know, wildlife are, are consumed as well. So that wildlife is important for, for you know, feeding yourself with also. It's not just, not just feeding yourself like if your corn, if you don't plant at the right time, your corn crop and all your crops will, will, will die and your family will, will, will suffer, but you're also the wildlife is important for that. So then I said connection to place is critical. It's something we often don't think about in terms of design, certainly not agroecosystem design, but for the Lock and Dome Maya and for systems throughout the world that I've seen, and primarily I've worked in Mesoamerica, to be fair, um, I, connection to place is critical. It's really the thing that we need to be designing for. You look at these different communities here, and all of them talk about their deep relationship with nature. And it's oftentimes, an animistic relationship with nature. Like nature is equal to them in terms of value. And, 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 and that's really common throughout these, these systems. You have a daily relationship, you're going to value nature. Now, now that's, that, that is important for, for, for conservation too. As we're thinking about conservation, well, how do we establish those relationships? But each of these communities, all of these places, everyone I've talked to has talked very intimately about the world that they are a part of. And you look at it in the educational system. I, this is, now, I've heard that, 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 that you all have learned some about Imergy, and, and, and isn't that right? And so, so, so this is, have you not been studying? So, okay, so anyway, so energy, so you understand the embodied energy in the system. You know this is a systems diagram, and we're looking at nature coming in to their understanding of, of the world. And so what, what, what Tom, Isaias Martinez, Tomek, and I, we looked at, we looked at the value of this traditional ecological knowledge in terms of the embodied energy in the system. So you don't have to understand this entire diagram. Essentially, all of this stuff flows into knowledge. And we did that comparing the, the traditional way of knowing with our scientific way of knowing, right? And with, with our Western educational system, kind of looking at literature values and kind of going back. And what we found was that there's a very similar quality if you look at everything that comes in. Because you look at, at for traditional ecological knowledge and local ecological knowledge, your classroom is the forest. And so you incorporate all of that stuff and it goes in. And, and in addition to that, this, the, when you look at sustainability metrics, um, metrics, like how much renewable energy goes into the system, these TK systems and LEK systems, oh, they're so much better than ours. Because look at this. We're standing on a bunch of oil. You know, look, this is all resources with the lights, the, the high, all, all everyone. It's everything. Is all a bunch of bunch of oil, which is the, the natural systems in the in the traditional systems. It's not that way. And so, if you're looking at sustainability, then maybe and what can we learn from that? Well, maybe more field classes. Maybe we should be doing a lot of our education outside. I mean, that would start to get at it. And so that that, that could be something something valuable for that. Okay, so I only have like five more minutes, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how I'm not sure I can get through this in five minutes. So how might TK guide agro, agro ecosystem design? Well, really it's looking backwards at, at everything that 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 we've learned from the others. So that we should be learning from TK and LEK as we're doing our agro ecosystem design. Uh, we should allow for succession and stress events. We should ask, why can't animals be everywhere and why can't why can't food be everywhere? And then we want to connect to place. It's the most important thing. And there's just been a few things that we've looked at. So this is a project that, that we, that um, uh, at Tomek and others, we worked on and looking at the Lock and Dome Maya system and compared to government forms of restoration. And setting, we set up a controlled experiment in Lock and Ha, Chan Seyab, and really looking at it over the long term and really finding that, that the systems are developing differently as you might expect. Um, so as you're, if you're thinking about Lock and Dome Maya for, 
or restoration for, for agroecosystem design. Yeah, they're de developing differently. The plant community is changing, but the Lacandomaya system gives people an immediate harvest. And so if you're looking at the way go government does restoration is they pay communities to plant trees and they do that for a couple of years. And, and, then, and then what happens after a couple of years? What do you think the community does? They chop it down. They put a milpa there, right? Because they can't wait. They can't wait 25 years for, for a, a mahogany to grow, or 30 years, 40 years. But if you have a Lacandomaya system, then maybe you get something all the way along. And so we're looking at this over the long term and kind of and measuring plant community and changes there. You allow succession and stress events. So this is worth some, some work that Eugene uh, did looking at different edible species that were that the that traditional uh, that indigenous groups around this area uh, were have have dis indigenous groups around this area have used uh, traditionally for years uh, ground nut uh, wild sunflower evening primrose and jusalem artichoke and looked at that for restoring a, a hay field and 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 what what we found was that um, that the harvested plants returned in year two without seeding. So you, you're, you're subtracting seeding from your equation, right? And then biomass is very comparable to, to what you would have for the, for the hay field. And then we did it with tilling and burning and with the control. And we found that, you know, there wasn't much of a difference. Maybe we can just let these systems come back without even preparing too much because there, the groundnut is adapted for here, and Jerusalem artichoke is adapted for here, so maybe we don't have to mess with it as much as far as land preparation. And that's, that's a big savings, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about any of this. More or less got right. Eugene said I more or less got right. <laughs> um, and ask why can't animals be everywhere? So, so this is another, since you all are now really good at systems diagrams, so um, this is another systems diagram. This is an agricultural system. So you have renewable resources that go in. You have purchased resources that go in. You have a production crop. You have some soil that's, 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 that's harvested. And then you have competing plants and competing, competing animals. And what we're doing with the purchased resources is we're, we're preventing succession, right? That's essentially why we're spraying, right? We're, we're preventing succession. We don't want a bunch of weeds, right? They're bad. But... And we don't want, certainly want a lot of, lot of animals eating our, eating our crops, so we control for that. Well, you know, that, that takes a lot of energy. And, and, and I'm not saying we, we wanna, wanna get rid of that, but you know, look at a, this is a restoration system. So now you're, now you're going after plant community and animal community. So those are the two things you're trying to develop. You're still trying to prevent succession. You still wanna control for one particular species here. You still have renewable re resources and still have human resources. You start to have a human community that come and see this beautiful place that you've created. What about, if you're thinking about animals, what about if you combine them and you have a novel ecosystem based on TK and LEK? Well, now you all can read this perfectly, right? <laughs> Essentially, you're getting cultural and provisioning ecosystem services by limiting how much you prevent succession in your system. You're still gonna prevent it, you still need some, I mean, Lacanomaya prevent succession. They, they weed. They do. But they don't do it with the intensity that we do it. And so maybe if you don't do it with the t intensity, maybe that human community can, can gain something from visiting these agroecosystems. Maybe these agroecosystems become places. I, you know, one, this was, okay, I, I, I'm running out of time, but I was in, I was in, um, Okay, this was when I was in Portugal, and, and I was sampling the soil at these, at these, at, at these viticulture systems, the Ubera systems with the trees and the vines, and, and it was a traditional system. And, I, and, I, and I, I swear, I swear this happened, that I was sampling, and this family, it was like a whole family, came skipping by me. <laughs> like skipping by me in the agroecosystem. In the, how many times have you been at a farm and a family has come skipping by you? It, it doesn't really happen all that often, right? But maybe, maybe it can. And maybe that's a value that we're not calculating. 
Skipping. That's a high value. That, that's like, I mean, when do you skip? Then it was the whole family. So, okay, then ask why can't food be everywhere? There's some other research that Avalon Bungie and I did. We, we looked at service bears, apples, mulberries, and black walnuts in the city of Syracuse and harvesting from those and how we, how we, how we can harvest from them, right? Like what's there already? Not what we planted, just what someone planted a long time ago. And maybe, maybe our agroecosystem doesn't have to be just at the farm. Maybe there's an apple tree right there. And when you're on break, you go and pick an apple and you eat it. Or you could just pick it and bring it home. You can do whatever you want with it. You make a pie with it later, whatever you want to do with that apple, but it's right there, right? Why can't it be everywhere? And so what we found is that, first of all, that there are edibles all over the city of Syracuse. Like these are, the red dots are edibles. And you see they're everywhere, everywhere. And then we also found that there was a difference in communities. So the poorer communities had fewer edibles. Why was that? I don't know, but they did. And so maybe we should be thinking about that in terms of urban ecosystem design. Seems like the poorer communities are where you really want to have more edibles, right? Free food right there, especially in food deserts like a lot of Syracuse. I don't know if you all knew this, but Syracuse is actually, for African Americans and Hispanics, it's actually the poorest city in the United States. Number one. And, and so, you know what? It would be valuable to have a lot of free food just everywhere. Why can't food be everywhere, right? It works in the Balkans. You know, why can't we have grapevines growing up our gas stations? I mean, I, I would want to taste, test the grape for sure, <laughs> but, but why can't we? You know, a lot of, I, I don't think gas would go into the grape, but I'd like to know. Hey, we should know that, right? And then connect to place is the most important thing. So how do you do that, right? Well, Marla Emery, back to food. Marla Emery, who, did, who works for the Forest Service, she did some research showing that if kids eat for the environment. It connects them to the environment forever. And, and that, so maybe that's another reason why food should be everywhere, right? Because so kids connect. So we've been doing service projects all around. There's Onondaga, um, there's an Onondaga watershed. So these are different service projects. A lot of them are with kids. Um, this is actually a, a, a series of rain gardens up and down the creek walk that we designed as part of an ecosystem restoration design class that Eugene was, was in. And then we ended up redoing it. And in the city, you know what? We had to redo it. When we redid it, so this is Eugene installing one of these rain gardens. That's Eugene right there. So, um, and, and it's edible rain gardens. So how you get people involved. And this is a place where people can come by. So we, the city loved it so much. They're like, hey, let's put in bigger rain gardens. Let's do it. And so we came up with designs. And then they're like, yeah, the sustainability coordinator was really into it. And then they uh, came back and they said, you know, we ran it by the lawyers. And we have to take the food out. Eat it. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, even with education, I'm like, these are the berries. This is the you. Don't eat the you. But I mean, we weren't going to plant you, right? I mean, no, because that would be, I mean, they're very few. In, it's not like we're in the, we're not like we're in the tropics here. I mean, most of, if you, go out, you could go out and eat grass, you'd be fine, you know? I mean, there are very little things that are poisonous around here. Um, and yet, you know, so we had to redesign for a, uh, what do we say? It, it was a, what do we call it? What do we call it? Do you remember what it was? It was like smellable ring. <laughs> Yes, sensory experience rain guard. So we, so, so we had to change that, but essentially we're trying to connect people with place. So, and then th this is just an example. Is this is, the, the, this is a, a community garden that we put at the Boys and Girls Club, getting kids involved in the system, getting involved early. So what do we learn here? Natural systems are complex but designable. Natural elements like stress events and succession are important. Food is everywhere and valuable. While that everywhere and valuable connection place is critical. And then what do we do? We learn from the TK and LEK. We allow succession whenever possible. We ask, why can't animals be everywhere? We ask, why can't food be everywhere? We connect the place. It's the most important thing. And that's all I've got.
Deal with uh, our winters here. I mean, I know you're talking about growing food and the yeah. question of storage. Do what, what did the Cayuga Nation do? What did yeah. we learn? Well, you know, so it's a good question. And, and um, so Catherine Landis uh, uh, did some, some great work. Uh, she did uh, finished her dissertation at at ESF, she didn't look at the Cayuga. She looked at the, at the Haudenosaunee and they did mo primarily focused on the Onondaga. And, and she found a very different sort of ecosystem looking historically, looking a couple of hundred years ago going forward than what we're seeing with the Lock and Dome system. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of water, there's a water-based system, a lot of it. So you've had the dynamic changes of Onondaga Lake. And so there's a lot of fishing going on during, especially during winter time, so it, but then you also saw the, the wetlands and the production of, of the wetlands, and so it was this dynamic change. They would store nuts, right? Uh, and then they would extract oils. Um, they, they, would, they would store you know, corn and beans and squash as, as well. They would dry things a lot. Um, but, but really, when I see the ecosystems that she's talking about and or that, she, that she found, um, it was this, this this similarly dynamic, different sort of ecosystem. I'd say there's a stronger animal base to it than you're seeing with the with the Lock and Dome system, um, and it's definitely more water than you're seeing with the Lock and Dome system. I think Cayuga would probably be pretty similar to that. Now, they she was telling me that as far as succession goes and, and like restarting succession, the Onondaga. They were not using fire because, of course, it was a very fire-resistant area. Um, they, were, they were girdling trees. Um, but I think in answer to your, to your question, there's a, uh, there, first of all, I think, I think um, Catherine, Catherine's work is some of the first really serious work about. I mean, people have, you know, it's been certain not that other people's work has been, hasn't been serious, but she's really went into, into this system and, and, and what she saw was, was a lot of um, wetland management um, in, in, in the system. So doesn't, not a perfect answer to what, what you're saying. But I also would argue that our, our landscape has changed. I mean, we, we, it's, it's going to be, we, um, are, we have structures here. So we can't, we can't recreate what we've, what we've got. We, we, our farms are structures as well. Um, instead, I think, and I think we have to do this with all systems, we have to think about novel agri-ecosystems that, that, that borrow from these, these, these ideas um, and then, then create something, something that, that takes as mo the most we can from, from, from our knowledge, from, from what we've learned from work like Catherine's, but then uses our work as well. So, so it's, I know it's not a perfect answer to what you're, what you're saying, uh, what you're asking. Um, anyone, anyone else? Yeah. How, how the what? So how did so in the in the traditional systems? How did they agree to keep some of that some of that area in wildlife? Oh, yeah. You know, I understand that there's different ways in how they, yeah. what's needed to maybe essentially maintain this communal land. Yeah, I, I can't uh, speak to that in, in, in general. I know in the, in the Lock and Dome Maya community and the Mopan Maya community, um, there are, um, 
so there, so there, there are, so, okay, there, different Maya communities are managing that in different ways. Where, where, where some are working very communally and you have a communal land and they, and they actually have to ask permission from every member of the community before they can develop an area. Um, in the Lock and Dome Maya community, they've actually partitioned out the land into family groups. And, and so you have to ask within your family if you're going to develop a, a particular area. So, and I, I would, from what I've, what I've seen, it's, it's, it's somewhere in that, in that right now, in some cases, like in Belize, some of that communal land, the government has said, you can't, you can't touch it anymore. So in some cases, it's the community that's doing it. Some cases, the family is doing it. Some cases, the government is doing it. There are lots of different, lots of different ways of approaching it. At least that's what, I've, that's what I've seen. Now, how do you design for it, which I think what you're really trying to get to, right? Um, you know, I don't know. Where you were, we're sharing. Yeah, I don't. I, I, that's that's the that's a million dollar question, right? Um, I uh, I I don't know. I mean, I'm, I I think I think part of it is um, is the ethic that that I think we're trying to do with the, the, the small, like, small projects working with kids. I, I don't think it's something that we're going to figure out. I think we're, we're very educated in a, in a different direction right now. And so I think, I think we have to um, take a long vision towards it and, and just be trying to edu educate the kids about it um, so that maybe their grandkids might be thinking about it differently. Unfortunately, I, I think that, that there's a, but then at the, at the same time, you see um, places like uh, Seattle and, and, and Detroit and Toronto and, uh, and Montreal that are, are creating these communal lands where, where people can harvest from those, those lands. Um, and um, and then of course we have government structures where with lots of conservation and so it's a it's a mixture. I'm not sure I'm not sure exactly what to do, frankly. Uh, but I think we want to start small. We don't want to want to at least try um, with these small steps. Yeah. Yeah. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.